General Abacha died in the early hours of 8 June 1998. His family decided he would not be given a military burial and had to be buried at night in Kano. Before leaving Abuja for Kano with the remains of General Abacha, I observed that some officers were not ready to go to Kano for the burial. They included Brigadier General Sabo, the DMI, Brigadier General Muazu, Commander Guards Brigade, and Colonel M.B. Marwa, Military Administrator, Lagos State. At the airport, I had to order Marwa to go into the aircraft to proceed to Kano. At that time, I had already given orders to Lieutenant Colonel Mana, CO81 Battalion, Kefi, to ensure no officer took any step against the government. He was not to take orders from anyone but me. He was ordered to deal with anyone who made any move to take over the government while we were in Kano. We returned from Kano and went into the chambers to decide who would become the commander-in-chief. While in Kano, some senior officers had decided the Koas would take over the government. I had never been interested in any political office, had avoided them so far, and had no intention of taking up the position of commander-in-chief. I made this clear to the senior officers who insisted I should take over, including Generals SVL Malu, Magashi, and Aziza. I was also aware of some junior officers who were against my taking over as commander-in-chief because they knew I would not tolerate them in service. The problem I had convincing the senior officers to allow General A. Abubakar to take over had to do with his record of conviction by a court-martial presided over by the late Colonel Nenge sometime between 1970 and 1972 when he tampered with soldiers' salaries and was convicted by court-martial and sentenced to two years' imprisonment. Fortunately for Abubakar, his classmates at the Provincial Secondary School Bida were at Army Headquarters. They worked it out and reduced the sentence to a reprimand. This was possible because at the time the Nigerian army had no legal department because the army did not have enough lawyers to handle one. Confirmation of court martial cases was left to the army administrative branch. That is how Abubakar's conviction was changed from two years of imprisonment to a reprimand. In that case, he was not dismissed or reduced in rank, but a reprimand in the Nigerian army is a conviction. Officers were not prepared to accept an officer with a record of conviction as a head of state. The issue of succession now fell to me and some of the commanding officers and the staff told me I had to take charge to save the situation. I told them I believed in Abubakar and we should support him. While this was going on, some junior officers were campaigning against Husseini and me. They believed that once I took over, they would be in trouble. But I never had any intention of taking any political post. I had joined the army not for politics. When I told the senior officers I would not take over as commander-in-chief, the officers close to me said I was going to regret this action. I did not believe them because General Bubaka and I had been very close friends since we had been lieutenants and played hockey for 2nd Mechanized Division with General Shiwiya Adua and Husseini. As soon as we got into the chambers, Abubakar started distributing papers as if we were going to be an election. Meanwhile, people were there with Bibles and Korans because they did not know who the commander-in-chief was going to be. It took a lot of persuasion to get the officers to accept General Abubakar. This was why during the swearing-in of the commander-in-chief, the Koran and the Bible were brought into the chambers, unknown to many officers and the PRC members. After the discussions, no decision was reached because papers were passed around for officers to nominate a commander-in-chief. I knew that problems could arise from there. When it was my turn, I got up and announced we had all agreed that General Abubakar was to be the commander-in-chief and had been promoted to a four-star general. Abubakar was sitting next to me. That was how we succeeded in making General Abubakar the commander-in-chief in spite of his record of conviction. I am glad that in the minutes of the PRC emergency meeting of 8 June 1998 at the council chambers at Sokoro Abuja, Mr. T. Fagbemi, who took the minutes, stated, a member supported succession by hierarchy. Then he announced the CDS Major General A.A. Abubakar as the HOS C in C. The member suggested further that we should be promoted to the rank of a four-star general. This member was General I.R. Bami, Chief of Army Staff. Questions were asked about why Lieutenant General J.T. Husseini, the most senior officer when General Abacha died, was not made Commander-in-Chief. Many put the blame on some of us at that time. It was difficult to sell Husseini for a number of reasons. 
First and foremost, General Husseini was the last officer to be with the late General Abacha when he died, and there were many insinuations of his involvement in Abacha's death. These were mere insinuations. I believe General Husseini had no hand in General Abacha's death. I became more convinced when, at the Uputa panel, a document recovered from a security officer's house and the officer's handwriting stated clearly, we killed Abacha. This document was handed over to the Uputa panel but was only mentioned in the corner of the Uputa panel report. Since it was about General Abacha, the government did not care to investigate the matter, nor did the panel make any recommendation about it. I strongly believe that if this document had been investigated, the truth of General Abacha's death would have been known. The second reason was that when politicians and some junior military officers were planning to make Abacha succeed himself, General Husseini was said to have been too involved in the succession plan. Although General Abacha did not show that he knew and approved of it, I believe he was aware and did not oppose it. We could not have supported General J.T. Husseini to succeed Abacha because of national interest and consideration of the Abacha family. As previously mentioned, my relationship with General Abubakar dates back to the immediate post-Civil War era when with a number of officers including Lieutenant S.V.L. Malu and Major J.T. Husseini, we played hockey together in Benin City. Against this backdrop, supporting General Abubakar was the natural thing to do. Unfortunately, as soon as he became the Commander-in-Chief, he changed. One day I went to see him while he was still in Fort Ibibi. He told me he hoped the job God had given him would not stay in our relationship. I was shocked by that statement but did not take it seriously. I told him he was the Commander-in-Chief and our relationship depended on him. He emphasized that he had been assured of my absolute loyalty during his nomination. I added that if at any time he felt threatened by me, I was ready to resign and go home. I thought the matter ended there. He started holding meetings with Generals Babangida and Aliu Gusau. I was receiving reports of their getting together. I did not bother myself about such meetings because I knew we were not staying long in government. Unknown to me, General Abubakar had already committed himself to Generals Babangida, Tiwai Danjuma and Aliu Gusau on General Obasanjo's coming in to take over from him, a proposal I totally objected to, which I told Generals Abubakar, Tiwai Danjuma and Aliu Gusau in very clear terms. My stand did not go very well with the Generals and General Abubakar started feeling unsafe. He started using some officers, especially from intelligence, to write all sorts of reports against me saying I was too ambitious and wanted to be the Commander-in-Chief. I expected General Abubakar to know that I had no ambition of becoming Commander-in-Chief since no one would have stopped me from taking over after General Abacha's death. One may ask why he did not simply remove me. This could have been because he knew I had a total control of the army and any move to remove me would have removed him as well. Even though he did not trust me, he knew he could not do without me. Then came the appointment to determine who his CGS would be. He asked for my suggestions. Out of loyalty and respect for seniority, I mentioned the two most senior officers then in service, Major General Rufus Kupolati and Air Vice Marshal Ainla, who was the minister. Abubakar told me that Kupolati from Kogi was from the north, just like him. This was true, but I thought Ainla, as the most senior officer, was most qualified. He told me he would think about it. The next day, he told me he had decided to make Chief of Naval Staff Ahigbe the CGS and make AVM Ainla the CNS. He said he would make me the CDS and Minister of Defense. I did not comment on this. After some days, he sent for me again and said he would keep me in the Army as Chief of Army Staff. I believe he had discussions with some friends and was advised to hold the Ministry of Defense. He asked for a suggestion for the CDS which should be outside the Army. I knew AVM Dagash was also a close friend of Abubakar and I suggested him. General Abubakar immediately agreed. We went into ministerial appointments in which some ministers were brought back while others were dropped. We agreed that General Pian Aziza was to be the Minister of Transport and Abubakar had me inform Aziza. Surprisingly, when the ministerial appointments were released, General Aziza was not the Minister of Transport. I now realize that a man's true character is only known when he has power and money. It is interesting to note that as Chief of Army Staff during Abubakar's time, 
I never received anything for the Nigerian army. For every project I planned, I always kept funds and was able to complete all of them. I left a cash and a bank balance of about 2 billion naira for General Malu who succeeded me. I am glad General Malu openly said this because he was also starved of funds by the Abbasanjo administration. The funds I left for him enabled him to run the army. It is evident that Abubakar was being misled from outside the government about me. This led to his taking me along when he visited the United Kingdom, the US and France for fear of being overthrown by me, a fear his advisors put into him. He should have known I was not the ambitious officer people said I was. If I had been, he wouldn't have been head of state. It was surprising that he could think of me ever overthrowing him. As a result of the fear that was put into Abubakar's mind, he did not do anything for the army in the one year he was commander-in-chief. He cancelled the purchase of motorcycles for soldiers that had been approved by General Abacha and fraudulently approved some purchases for the army through the office of the CGS without the knowledge of the army. General Abubakar and his group inside and outside the military arranged to carry out investigation into the alleged criminal activities during Abacha's time which included assassinations and attempted assassinations. They used soldiers like Sergeant Rogers Jabila. These investigations were carried out without my knowledge as Chief of Army Staff, even though my soldiers were being investigated. General Abubakar handed over these reports with a strong recommendation that I be detained and be kept in custody for a long time so democracy could survive because I did not support the emergence of an ex-military officer as president. He was supported by some northern generals who believed one of them would take over from Obasanjo after one term of four years. It was alleged that Obasanjo had promised General Babangida that he would succeed him. One of those who brought in General Obasanjo to become the president of Nigeria has now agreed that General Obasanjo has been a failure as reported by the Daily Sun newspaper of Wednesday, 17th August 2011, Volume 6, Number 2160. General Babangida was quoted as saying that Obasanjo's administration lacked foresight and imagination and he accused Obasanjo of wasting the economic affluence of the country. I stand vindicated for opposing these generals who supported my arrest and detention for opposing Obasanjo as president of Nigeria in 1999. I paid the price for my stand but Nigeria is paying a higher price for Obasanjo's wickedness to Nigeria, especially the northern part of the country. The generals now know better and I believe they know they cannot play God. Sometimes when you think you are the wisest person, you turn out to be the greatest fool. General Abubakar prepared and handed over his report to General Obasanjo's team dated June 1998. This means he prepared the report as soon as he was sworn in as the commander-in-chief in June 1998. The Obasanjo government then prepared his report dated 5th to 26th July 1999. In the letter to the NSA, General Gusau, it clearly stated that the report was handed over to them for democracy to thrive in the Third Republic. The report accused me of many things, including the following. 1. That I was dissatisfied with the appointment of Abubakar as C in C. 2. That I was working with the opposition and foreign embassies to create the state of insecurity in the country. The report accused the U.S. government of having set aside $50 million toward this destabilizing objective. Out of this money, the report stated I had collected $10 million in March 1998 and I disbursed the money to my loyal officers. 3. That I had made many friends with people from the South when I was commander for Mechanized Brigade and that I made a lot of money in dollars as a result of oil bunkering and my friends in Niger Delta were keeping the money for me. This report stated that one, Mr. Isaac Pobeni was to be dealt with because he challenged my authority over an oil deal. The report also mentioned one, Mr. James Iburi. I have never met any of these people in my life, nor did I ever know how oil bunkering is carried out. Four, that I was invited by the C in C General Abubakar and I told the CNC that the army would not accept an ex-serviceman, especially General Olushegun Obasanjo. 5. That when the CNC asked me to suggest from the Southwest who could secure the corporate existence of Nigeria, I suggested Chief Olu Falaye. 
No one ever asked me to suggest anybody and no one ever discussed the issue of who became the president after General Abubakar. On my own, when I discovered that somehow individuals who offended the Southwest, especially the annulment of the election won by Chief M.K. Abiola, wanted to produce a president from the Southwest, I decided to take Chief Olufalae to General Abubakar and only Abubakar and I discussed this issue. I do not regret that action because I was and I am still convinced Chief Olufalae would have done better as a president of our great country. I am glad those behind Obasanjo now know better. At the end, the report recommended 1. We hereby recommend that some of his past deeds be revisited by the states so that it will be used against him to keep him out of circulation pending the stabilization of democracy. 2. The Director General of the State Security Service and the NSA should look at the case files and choose the ones that can keep him out of circulation for some years. 3. He was noted to have sponsored some killings of citizens of this country of which some reports were with various teams set up to look at these activities at the state headquarters. Interestingly, all these false allegations were made by Brigadier General Sabo, Colonel Marwa and Colonel Omenka which Brigadier General Sabo and Major Hamza al-Mustafa claimed they were directed to make against me by late General Abacha to keep me busy and not disturb their self-succession program. Brigadier General Sabo and Major al-Mustafa independently asserted that the document was a directive from the late head of state CNC as diversionary tactics to preoccupy the Chief of Army Staff with defense of his tarnished image. Colonel M.B. Mara was privy to this project, and in a meeting with Brigadier General Sabu, Colonel Olu, and Colonel Omenka in Ikoi, Lagos contributed information that could portray Chief of Army staff in bad light in the public eye. Since the Obasanjo administration had accepted General Abubakar's recommendations, the government had to look for reasons to detain me at all costs. The allegations concocted by Sabo and his group became handy even though they agreed that they lied that General Abacha had directed them. It is gratifying to note that after my discharge and acquittal by Lagos High Courts, Rogers, Maichibi and Mohammed Kataku changed their statements saying they had been told to lie, had been promised rewards and had received rewards to implicate me and other persons accused. Anytime there is assignment because the instruction that they are giving us is what they are telling us is that these people want to break this country into two they are importing arms and ammunition into nigeria we go into bush move about searching for arms and ammunition no food at times but later on oh, it is not easy for somebody to come out and say it later on when i come to realize when abacha died I saw some of those people that we are looking for as terrorists, as people that are importing arms and ammunition into Nigeria, as people that are inviting uh, terrorists to come and kill Abacha, because some they said they are inviting terrorists to come and kill Abacha. We will go and be waiting for them throughout day and night in this Lagos. We will not see them. Some we will lay ambush, we will go into bush, we will cross, we will not see who we are looking for, we will not see arms and ammunition. Though there, we have contact agents that used to take us to all these places, we don't know them, they take, we don't see it. So when Abdul Salam came into power, I saw some of these people again. They come to the villa. <laughs> I was surprised. And uh, I saw again, uh, I, I met with uh, General Bami again when he was talking about uh, 